Hello, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Um, so hello and welcome. My name is Lainey Rose. I'm the events manager here at East City Bookshop. It is so wonderful to be with you all this evening and especially to our virtual audience. We appreciate you being here as well. We love the accessibility that virtual events provide and we are also delighted to be able to welcome so many of you back to the store to participate face to face. Events are in full swing here at East City Bookshop and also coming up this month we have Megan Wagner Lloyd in the store, Queer Speed Dating, Black History Month Bookstore Trivia Nights, and an Open Mic Night. We also have 14 different book clubs, one of which being the Queering the Narrative Book Club, and so be sure to check out our website for more information about all of that. Before we get the show on the road, we have some housekeeping details. Number one, we appreciate you wearing your mask while you're seated at the event and in the signing line. Masks are optional while shopping and browsing, but we've elected to continue to ask for them while we're all seated closely together for an extended period of time. So thank you for doing your part. Number two, if you need a restroom, it's upstairs past the cash registers and the greeting cards. Number three, if you're watching from home and experiencing any technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat. My colleague Emma is monitoring that and can help if necessary. Number four, we will have time for questions tonight for both in-person and virtual attendees. So even if you're watching via Zoom, you can participate. Please put those questions in the Q&A feature so that Emma can see them and ask on your behalf. And finally, most importantly, if you need to purchase a copy of the book, we have copies available and we'd be glad to help you out with that. A purchase of any book by TJ Klune or KM Spera is required to join the signing line so you can purchase copies upstairs and receive a wristband from a staff member. For as long as I've worked here, our booksellers have loved TJ Klune. The warmth of his books has been a constant in our customers' hands, and we could not be more excited to be welcoming him to the store and to be welcoming, welcoming all of you to Charon's Crossing, where the tea is hot, the scones are fresh, and the dead are just passing through. When a reaper comes to collect Wallace from his own funeral, Wallace begins to suspect he might be dead. And when Hugo, the owner of a peculiar tea shop, promises to help him cross over, Wallace decides he's definitely dead. But even in death, he's not ready to abandon the life he's barely lived. So when Wallace is given one week to cross over, he sets about living a lifetime in seven days. Hilarious, haunting, and kind, Under the Whispering Door is an uplifting story about a life spent at the office and a death spent building a home. T.J. Klune is the New York Times and USA Today best-selling Lambda Literary Award-winning author of The House in the Cerulean Sea, Under the Whispering Door, The Extraordinaries, and more. Being queer himself, Clune believes it's important, now more than ever, to have accurate, positive representation in stories. K.M. Spera is a queer and trans author who lives in Baltimore with his tiny dog and goofy cat. He is the author of speculative novels such as First Become Ashes and Docile, and a third in 2022 that follows up on his Hugo and Nebula-nominated novelette, Small Changes Over Long Periods of Time. They're about cults and trauma, consent and debt, and a horny trans vampire, respectively. His short fiction appears in Tor.com, Uncanny, Lightspeed, and more. Please welcome our authors of the evening. Hello? Test. Oh, there it goes. Hi. Now I don't have to yell at all of you. Sorry, the people in the front row that I was yelling at. Um, but I am so sorry that I'm late and I'm so glad to see all of you. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming. Oh my gosh, this space is so beautiful. I was here like five years ago last and it's stunning. It is. This is absolutely gorgeous. I think this is my first time here. I don't think I've been here before. That's awesome. Okay. Before we get started real quick, did has anybody been to, did anybody go to my Arlington event or my Baltimore event? Just you and you. Okay. Uh, some of the jokes might be the same. So just remember that. <laughs> and also something that I always want to say, I don't see any younger uh, children in the audience, but if there are children in the audience, my bad, I curse a lot. And that is just something you're going to have to live with. If you go home and you you talk to your parents and you, and you say the same word that I did, just remember, all you have to do is reply, but TJ Klune said it and it's totally fine. So I apologize in advance if I offend you and 
get over it, I guess. <laughs> well, when I was like, got the invitation to this event, I was like, so I'm like new of TJ's books. And I sat down and did the audiobook again. And I was like, God, these are so sweet and wholesome. And my books are chock full of explicit sex scenes. I know, I know. But it's so fun. It's so funny because, you know, I, I we were talking back. I was I was telling you how I, I love docile. And um, what, what's so funny is, yes, there is a wide gulf between what we do, but they run the, the gamut of queer, the queer experience. And also, if you know me, if you know me beyond just these books, if you know Tales from Verania, for example, which is affectionately known as erotic Shrek, then you know <laughs> that I, I know my way around sex scenes, but they just don't necessarily feel like for this kind of book that I wanted yeah, to write with when that. I so people pitch me stuff all the time and they're like you're gonna love it there's sex in it which is what I get but people don't know that my standard is like very uh explicitly written and my friend who uh isn't uh is an editor uh was pitching me okay whispering door you should read this one next and uh she's like yeah there's like a sex scene in this one I was like there is a sex scene in this one I'm ready and like we get towards the end and she I was like was it that like ghost moment in the bedroom <laughs> and she's watching this so hi uh, I was like was that like the ghost sex in the bedroom she's like I think so yeah <laughs> like that's it we got it it was very romantic and beautiful it, it was, well thank you I I do appreciate that and I, I for a second you you kind of freaked me out because I was like, did I write a sex scene in that book and I just don't remember? I mean, I, I understand that everybody likes ghost dick, but I mean, come on. <laughs> when you're an author, you like forget what happens in your own books after a while. And people are like on page 72 when that guy says a thing and you're like, holy shit, no. Can I, can I ask you a question? Do yeah. you ever get weirded out when you have to edit your sex scenes? When, you're, when your editor gives feedback on you and you're going through your notes and you have to edit your sex scenes knowing somebody else has read your depravity and they are getting ready to edit it whenever i have written a sex scene and it has to go back to my editor and i get those notes back i'm like ew i'm so gross and then you, you use certain types of language in sex scene and then your editor uses that same kind of language to show a point in the comments i'm like ew we're all so gross <laughs> This is not happening to me. I have no shame. <laughs> I'm like, so we would say cock instead of dick here. Um, and uh, sometimes copy editors don't understand that like safe word is one word. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I, I know that that whenever um, I do end up putting a sex scene in a book and it comes back through edits, that is going to be the very last thing that I edit. I will skip over that and come back to it at the end and I will delay as much as I possibly can. I will do other things instead of thinking about the work that I need to do because I don't want people to, I don't want to have to edit or read my editor's comments on my grossness. <laughs> it feels weird. Okay, well, here's the question. Do you listen to your own audiobooks? Can you? I can't. No, I, no. I, I'm I like, oh my I God. Do, I do. If if somebody is auditioning, and I haven't had that done in a while, but yes. if somebody is auditioning, um, yeah, I'll, I'll listen for a couple of seconds. But with, with the narrators that I use, like for this book, Kurt Graves did the narration. He was wonderful. Incredible. Yes. Um, he also does my Green Creek series. He also does Murmuration. Michael Leslie, who does so many of my books, Daniel Henning, you know, did The House in the Cerulean Sea. He's also going to be doing In the Lives of Puppets. So what, what I love about that is I am I have put my complete and total faith in them. So what whatever they want to do with the words, I'm totally fine with. I don't, I don't necessarily need to give feedback because I trust them because I've worked with them for so long. Daniel, his first book with me was The House in the Cerulean Sea. I heard his um, his version of Chauncey first, mm. like it, listening to auditions. I heard his version of Chauncey. I was like, sold. That's totally good. For In the Lives of Puppets, I wanted Daniel, but you know, they say, well, let's give a couple other people audition, stuff like that. I heard his version of one of the characters, the, the nurse ratchet, the registered automaton to care, heal, educate, and drill. She plays the, she's the 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 sociopathic side of the main character's personality there because she acts as like the Jiminy Cricket character, but um, he his voice for that was instantly the once I pressed play and heard him speak her line I was like he can have it it's it he's the most perfect person in the entire world for this book. Yeah, I don't like listening to the sex scenes. I'm always like, okay, but here's the thing. No, you wait, wait a minute. You were just saying I'm depraved. I can do all of this kind of stuff. 
and I can't But then talk you could be it. a prude when it comes to it's just As soon as someone's like, oh no, I have to listen to somebody else read my set. It's reading it back out loud to me. Like I have to, that's when I have to face it. I'm like, oh no. Oh, you fake. <laughs> I've got, I've gotten, I've gotten emails from people who have listened to books of mine uh, on audio and their books with the sex scenes. They'll be like, I was sitting at a stoplight and my windows were down and everything was going fine because I was like, this is a TJ Klune story. And then they started talking about anal lubes. And I was like, <laughs> and I had to roll up the window and I was so embarrassed. I was like, well, oh. you know, not at that level because there was no ghost lube in these. Uh, <laughs> but um, but I do. I was I listen to audiobooks almost exclusively nowadays. I just don't have time to sit down and do this anymore. Um but what is it, Libro FM through your local bookstore? Use them. Yes. Um, and I'm driving with my windows down, listening to this, and I'm like, are they gonna kiss? And I say this the windows, everything stopped in the windows. I'm like, they're gonna kiss. It's gonna happen. <laughs> and I'm like shouting, I'm like putting the windows up, like looking at the people next to me, like, no one observed this. <laughs> I love that. I love I love the audio medium specifically for that. You know, we for some reason it comes up every now and then it starts to rear its ugly head the idea that audios aren't reading. Uh. And that's just the biggest BS I've ever heard. Of course it is. It first and foremost that that could be technically ableist when people say something yeah. like that, but second of all, you are still consuming the product, the story, and not only that, it's being told to you in a theatrical kind of way. So that cool. is so cool to be able to do that. I, I know there's certain audiobooks that I adore mm -hmm. that I love to listen to just because it puts me in the sense of place. And that narrator to me is those characters. They are those voices. So when I see people say, no, audio doesn't count as reading, I'm like, who are you to be like a gatekeeper as to what is or isn't reading? Let people enjoy themselves. I can't even listen to that TJ Klune read his own books anymore. I'm so spoiled. No, I would never do <laughs> my own audio ever. I mean, listen to my voice. I have like vocal fry going on and it's not, I would never be able to. Do that. Just would a queer do thing. Don't we all have vocal fry? No, would, you, would you ever want to narrate your own? No. I mean, I read them to myself, like in my car. I'm like getting really hyped up in character voice. And I'm like, no, don't do it. Don't go there. No, I'll stay or whatever. Like real dramatic, but like while I'm writing it, but I would never. Um, I want to like go wild. And I know this is like, we have been here for like five minutes, like riffing about audiobooks, but like you've been to a lot of events. What's the question that nobody else asked you that you would love to talk about? Specifically about Under the Whispering Door? I mean, that one was my fave, so. yeah. So I get with, I'm going to try to couch this with, with what I, what I get a lot of with under the whispering door and, and it's not, it's a good thing. Okay. Um, what I get a lot of what I've found, and it's been extraordinarily interesting is as you know, under the whispering door is a story about grief. It is a story about the way grief affects us. It's how it, it hits us and how the fact that no two people experience grief the same way, yet we, it's still universal. Everybody knows and experiences grief at some point in their life. What has happened with this book, and it's something that I maybe should have expected, but didn't really think of, is that I have gotten so many stories of other people's grief. Mm. I have gotten stories of pe people write to me or, or talk to me at events or whatever, and they tell me their own stories of grief. And I, 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 I liken that to therapy in a way, because I, I am not qualified to be a therapist by any stretch of the imagination. But when you go to therapy, you're telling essentially your deepest secrets to a stranger. And that's easier to do than it is to tell that to somebody that you love or care about, because you don't know what they would think about you if you if you told them something that that you think is mm -hmm. not okay in your head or whatever. So I think that in a way, I'm a stranger. I'm a proxy. I am this person who wrote this book that talks about the the pain and the 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 what it takes to to move through the process of grief. And I've heard so many stories about that grief and 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 what it does to people. And it's extraordinary. It is absolutely transformational. But what I don't get a lot of from this book that I, I wish I could have gotten more, maybe, is is the idea of of Wallace's growth through the book. We get Wallace, we talk about it. I talk about it at the events that I do. I talk about how how Wallace is m my stand-in for Ebenezer Scrooge, mm -hmm. that this is my take on Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And the reason that I did that was because I didn't like the way, 
I didn't like the way Dickens did it. <laughs> Take that, Dickens, I, uh, if you're listening. I, uh, I said I said that once to at, at an event, and I was I was on a panel with another author, and I said that or something something similar to that. And the look she gave me, <laughs> you would you would have thought like she like she honestly expected like me to be attacked, like the audience was going to go nuts because she was like, get him, everyone. But no, in 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 the Scrooge in in a Christmas Carol, you you see Scrooge go th- go get told he's a bad person, shown he's a bad person. At the very end, he's not a bad person anymore, and that's awesome. That's great. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful story. But I want to see what happens when an awful, terrible person has to put in the work I'm to becoming you. a better person. I need to feel that organic nature of their growth. The first chapter in Under the Whispering Door, that was not part that was not in my original manuscript i did not the book opened with the funeral and the reason i went back and added that opening chapter was because my beta readers came to me and said we kind of get that wallace is supposed to be a jerk but you never actually show him being a jerk before he dies so we we kind of want to get that so i was like okay and i had to walk a very fine line because if somebody comes off as too much of an asshole you're, the reader's not going to root for them, and they're not going to find they're not going to find a way to connect with them. But if their if their um, their journey is like that, then you're not going to believe that either, because you know, okay, he, it's unearned. So there's this tricky line you have to walk in order to be able to have that growth be realistic, even in a story of the fantastical, because that's what I love. I love realism in stories about the fantasy. So I work at a law firm. Disclaimer, I love my job. If you're watching, <laughs> home, uh, work for my company. Um, I'm a paralegal by day, as they say. And when I started reading that, oh, I, no. I didn't read the, it was audiobook, So I didn't really read the back of the book. I just knew I was going to read it. I was like, okay, here we go. And I was like, oh, this lawyer who's like a dick. And I was like, wow. This is really hitting close to Do you home. know you know people like I that. I know no lawyers who are dicks yeah. under oath. Um, <laughs> This is going to be used in like a deposition. I guess. You. <laughs> Peanut this. Um, yeah, no, but I thought that that was uh, way too relatable content for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, I feel like now way cooler than everybody else who's asked you other questions because like Wallace's slow growth was like at the top of my list. Awesome. Because I here's where our books do connect. I love writing people making real slow change over time. I think that is realistic, um, watching somebody grow and, um, you know, there's a whole sort of like, oh, you want to write this book or the story where you focus on the person who like already knows what's right and just sort of thrusts forward. Mm -hmm. But then to have the other character in Docile, there's Alex, who is a terrible person at the beginning and then slowly like realizes the error of his ways over the course of the book. And what is reapplying yourself to really changing look like it looks like wallace you know um fumbling through interactions with nelson and cameron and the mother who comes by the store all the time nancy god they all hit me so much all this like major well major side characters you know what i mean the, the each of them was supposed to represent a different component of death um and not just of death out in the world, but death that I've experienced, Mm. death that I've been a part of. I have lost people to violence and murder. I have lost people to suicide. I have lost people to illness. I have lost people. We all have. We have all lost people. And I don't, I'm not going to say that I know loss better than anybody else. But when I was five years old, my dad and my uncle went on a hunting trip that I was supposed to go on with them, but I was sick that morning. They were killed Mm. in a car accident. I came to depend on my grandfather. A year later, he died of cancer. Mm. I came to, be, to depend on my uncle. He died two years later after that. And then, you know, you grow up with this idea of grief. You know, the idea that I can say, and it be true, that my first funeral was when I was five years old. And I remember it. I remember it because I remember that we, as the family, we had to sit in this area that was like off the main everything. And there was a black veil in front of us that you could see through and everything like that. But that's where we sat. And that is my first real memory of death and what death does to people. And if you know my story, you know, I wrote this book for a very particular reason. Um, I lost my partner. Uh, He passed away unexpectedly. Um, Well, I shouldn't say unexpectedly. He fell ill unexpectedly. One day he collapsed in our home 
and it turned out that he had a tumor on his brainstem. We did not know that. And the reason he collapsed was because this nerve, the brainstem where that sits, it sends everything from your head down to the rest of your body. So when that is being squeezed and when that's being blocked, you don't have control over the rest of your body. That day in December of 2013 started this journey that I've been on ever since, because not only did, did, did Eric, who, if you do not know, Eric Arvin is one of, was one of the, and is one of the best authors. If you have never, if you want to read a a different type of book about the afterlife, read his woke up in a strange place. If you've read the dedication to this book, it's dedicated to Eric and me telling him, I hope he woke up in a strange place because his book woke up in a strange place is phenomenal. I, we always had this joke between us. I always had the, um, the bigger success, but he was always the better writer. Well, hands down the better writer. Nobody could write prose like him. He was so good at what he did. He was so good at what he did and losing him was catastrophic. Losing him was destructive in ways that I was not prepared for because I had just proposed six, six weeks before. And we were going to be, this was how, this is the beginning of the rest of my life. And the rest of my life turned out to be him in the hospital, uh, going through surgery, coming out of that surgery, a paraplegic from paralyzed from the neck down, and then having to be on ventilator care for the rest of his life. And you know what happens if, in case you don't know, a lot of people who are on ventilator care, they end up passing away because of pneumonia. And that is just something that happens. You have an open hole in your body with air and 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 liquid or or anything going in. That's what happens. And when it happened, I did not know what to do because to me, I saw the entire world going about their lives, about their day, as if my whole world just wasn't completely and utterly destroyed. I was so angry. I hated everyone. I hated everything. I didn't want to talk to my friends, my family, his family, his friends, any of that. I didn't want that because as far as I was concerned, this was the most unfair thing that had ever happened to anyone. And that's what grief is. That is what grief is. It is so inherently selfish, but it's supposed to be because it's not about what had happened to others. It's about how it affects us. And coming out of that, the reason I wrote Under the Whispering Door was to try to find a way to explain what grief actually is, to try to find out why no two people experience it the same way that if you live long enough to know what love is, you will know loss. You will at some point, whether it be the loss of family, friends, the loss of opportunities, pets, anything like that, they can all be grief. I don't know that I found what I was looking for by the time I finished, but what I did find was that I, I'm not afraid of death anymore. I'm not afraid of, of what comes next, if anything. I don't know what comes next, if anything, but I'm not afraid anymore because when I go, whenever that is, I'll go knowing I tried my best. And that's, I think, all anybody can ask of anyone. Fuck, you're going to make me like cry again in real life. <laughs> Can't do this to me. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you to like basically, I mean, as a queer author writing this book, you know, dealing with grief and death and transition. It's it's not just death once for some of these characters. It's death, a sort of death twice. It is moving on. Like, how do you feel like your queerness informed your writing this book as opposed to someone else? Right. So twofold. And and one is that if <laughs> and I don't mean to offend anyone here, but if so, if you're offended, you can probably leave. But um <laughs> If a straight person had written this book, or if if somebody with an agenda had written this book, mm -hmm. you would see probably the same type of things that I saw when I was doing my research for this book. In that, the thing that and I want to talk about a character specific because of this, Cameron. If you know Cameron, you know he's a husk. You know that he, that's what he became because he made a decision. He chose to end his life because he was in so much pain. I almost was Cameron. I, I know what it feels like to be there. I know what it feels like to be a husk. And that's why I included that with them. And the reason I included that with the idea of, of suicidal ideation or death by suicide, the reason I included that with them was because of something that I remember from growing up. 
I did not come from a family of religion. Thank God, because they were already screwed up in so many other ways. <laughs> but, okay, you have to stick with me here. My step-grandparents were very religious. And not only were they very religious, they lived in a tiny little town in Oregon called Glendale, has about 400 people. So you can imagine the kind of church that would be in this, in this area that I had to go to every time we went to them. And this church was fire. It was brimstone. It was gays are going to hell. It was people who commit suicide are going to hell. And that is something that has always stuck with me. You have faith, you have religion, you have this belief in a higher power. And this higher power is going to say people who end their lives because of their pain, their suffering, and that's the only choice that they make, that they're going to hell. I don't want any part of a religion that thinks that. I don't want to be any part of a God who thinks that people who make that choice should suffer for the rest of their lives because of it. So with Cameron, his story with the sunshine man, with Zach, it was what I hope happens for us all, that even when we're lost, even if we make that choice, even if that's the only thing that we think that can be left to save us, that you're going to be okay afterwards, that you will be okay because no matter what, my faith is not in God. My faith is in people. And I choose to believe that if it's any, if the afterlife or the beginning of the afterlife is anything like I've written, then I know that people like Cameron will find a place like the tea shop and they will be welcomed wholeheartedly. I'm going to reread this book immediately. <laughs> After leaving here, um, it's about 740. Unless you have anything last you want to slide in. Yeah, I do. Please can slide I away. Can I tell you guys something really quick? Like just just to just to be a little tease for you all. Because I know so we can know what's like, oh, so we got under the whispering door. That's so cool. And and next is in the lives of puppets, which comes out in April. And that's my queer retelling of Carlo Collodi's The Adventures of Pinocchio. But instead of involving puppets, it involves machines. And it is kind of different than than these two books um i will make you fall in love with a vacuum cleaner named rambo <laughs> he has social anxiety I love him. and he's the, he's the other half of the conscience of the jiminy cricket so you have nurse ratchet who's a nursing machine and then you have roomba that rambo the roomba vacuum who has social anxiety <laughs> stop you're killing me oh my god so there's a big there's a big question mark after that isn't there because this in the Lives of Puppets is my last book with this deal with Tor, because I have done six books with them since 2020. I have done the 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 extraordinary series for my young adult series, and I've done these three books, including In the Lives of Puppets, upcoming. So, what comes next? Would you like me to give you a hint about what comes next? How many of you have read the book called The House in the Cerulean Sea? Never heard of it. <laughs> Y'all remember at the very end of that book where it's all like, oh my God, there's a Yeti named David. <laughs> oh, so cool. What is the day Yeti? Well, I really found out that you cannot tease a Yeti without actual follow through. So I guess we're going to have to go back to the island in 2024. And I'll tell you one other thing about it. It is from the perspective of Arthur Parnassus this time around. So it's going to be a very different kind of book. And then after that, in 2025, I wrote a book from the perspective of a dog named Riley who thinks he's immortal because he misunderstands something his mother has told him. And then he finds out from a dog called the Oracle, which is a really old crusty poodle, that he is not, in fact, um, immortal. And him being a drama queen starts to spiral. So he sets out to discover what is happiness, what is joy, what does, what does that look like? And he decides that it's getting his owner, Jake, a boyfriend. So the whole book, and it's also my, my, I wanted to write my dog into a book. And so I can do that. And it's also my, my take on a couple of my favorite childhood movies, Homeward Bound and Milo and Otis. Okay. So one, how do I get this dog for myself? Yeah. So I can get a boyfriend like that. That's so cool. Two, I was like, Yeti, is there going to be some like Yeti loving in this book? <laughs> no. There are bear jokes. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm sorry. I was the conversation partner yeah. for this. <laughs> I to to David, there will not be any Yeti loving, but there will be David 
he wants to be an actor. I'll say that. So he's very into theater. <laughs> so we'll go that direction. Okay, well, maybe the th the three quill. Yeah. There will be some Yeti love in. All right. Um, questions time. Uh, okay, cool. They're already going up. I saw like a neon yellow hand back there. And I'll, like, I'll tell you something too. If if you all ask a really good question that catches my surprise, I might have something for you that nobody else will get to have. An arc of In the Lives of Puppets. <gasps> Good question. No pressure. I saw you. You have like the part in the middle. Um, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stand up. Yep. Oh, you're not wearing neon yellow. I totally lied. Cool. I'm going to repeat the question. So just say it as loud as you can. Okay, so for our online audience, the question is, um, this reader has an arc of the life of puppets, in the lives of puppets, and um, is interested to hear about TJ talk about his craft and how he goes about picking things up and putting them down. You are going to be so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> the reason, I, and I'm not shitting you, the reason in the lives of puppets exists is because I bought a Roomba vacuum cleaner and put googly eyes on it. And I let it go around my house and I was like following it around. Like, you're like a, you're like a weird little dude, aren't you? Oh, are you beeping at me? What you doing? What you doing? And then it like bumped into a wall and made this little beepy sound like, oh, and I was like, oh. this entire story just like blew up in my head around. And it's because I bought a vacuum. You have in the lives of puppets, because of capitalism. Okay. So <laughs> is this a sponsored book? Like Vina's like, hi, I'm TJ. And when I want to vacuum my house. <laughs> Funnily enough, I never used the word Roomba in that book at all. What yeah, brands do you want to endorse yeah. in your books? Is exactly. Real thing you exactly. Think about? Yeah. 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 So my craft is this. I, I didn't obviously sit down to write right away. I outline like crazy in that. I, my outlines are ridiculous because they're probably in the lives of puppets was probably 50, 60,000 words long, just the outline. And I do that because I put things on this outline that'll never make it into the book, but are just little details about the world and the characters that make it feel lived in for me. So, I mean, you don't necessarily need to know the main character of Victor's birthday. Well, what is it? I can't remember off the top of my head. But you don't you don't need to know, you know, you know, certain things about his life and stuff. But I put that on my outline because it helps me to to uh live in this world and to create this world with these characters. And um outlines save lives. That's all I'll say. Because if 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 you're trying to write something fantasy by the seat of your pants, man, you are. I'm a discovery writer. Oh my God. I, How do you do that? I do have an outline, but I need to leave space because like a character will say something and it literally gives me yeah. an idea that like kills oh, the entire plot fair. line. And I'm like, absolutely why fair. did I even yeah. write that? Outlines to me are living documents and that they should be updated. They're not set in stone. So it, it should be something that I could change if I need to. And that's happened multiple times. And it sucks when it happens because <laughs> you're like, what are you doing? Thank you for the question. All right. Uh, yellow right here. So the question uh, concerns all the iconic houses in the Clune verse, yep. um, and uh, does he sort of plot them out first and give rooms, assignments, etc., or does he invent rooms as he goes? One might say Discovery writes those rooms. Yeah. With Under the Whispering Door, I plotted out each level of the house. Um, with the house in the Cerulean Sea, I did not, which is something I discovered in when I was writing the sequel, because I was like, wait, what does this fucking house look like again? Where are all the rooms? Who are who are these children? <laughs> so um, I, I 
I, I have learned to do that better now. So I don't have to run into that issue again. Um, but I, I love, I just love the idea of, of like the house in the house in the story you see set up against the cliff or this tea shop, how awkward and, and how unique it is. I just love the idea of homes that don't look like homes, that, that they could be anything. Looks like it's held up by magic. Exactly. Exactly. And this, I mean, as she, hopefully all of you know, um, this cover is done by Chris Sickles with Red Nose Studios. He builds these. This isn't a photograph. He builds these sets and everything you see on here, he hand built and everything. I actually have the tea shop sitting on my desk at home and he, he, he gave it to me. And when you press a button right near the scooter, the door lights up at the very top of the house and, uh, and see it lights up and it's just the coolest thing in the world. I, I am so lucky to be work with people who, who can make beautiful things like that. Like with my audios, I trust Chris implicitly. If he has an idea, say, go for it, knock it out. I think that tour did an article where they like went through the steps of what it was like to have made all this. So if anyone's interested, you can look it up. Yeah. And if you look on, on his or my Instagram, he does fly throughs of each of the sets. So you can see what it looks like aside from the outside of the photographs. Yeah. It's so cool. All right. I see that you're there. I'm going to go back front, back front. Okay. So you in the blue mask there. It's cool. Take a moment and like, just breathe. Okay, so the first part of this question is what books got you through it when you were young? And the other part is what the heck is your Roomba named? His, Hers is named his, his name is Hank. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. He just looks like a Hank. Um, books when I was a kid. So I grew up in a shitty home. I, I, I'm going to be forthright about that. My parents did not like having a queer kid with undiagnosed ADHD who love to read. I got made fun of for reading. I got made fun of from writing from people who should know better. And so I kept the fact that I love to read and write a secret from everyone because it was one of those things that could be taken away. And it could have been because that's what those kind of people were. Um, my library, the Douglas County Library in Roseburg, Oregon was my life. I would not be here without that library because I would drive there or ride my bike there every day during the summer and stay there from the morning until it closed. The librarian was the first person I came out to, and she brought me books with queer people in them. Unfortunately, she brought me the book, The Front Runner. If you know The Front Runner by Patricia Nell Warren, it was a book written by a straight woman in the 70s, and it was, uh, it's oft considered the first mainstream and critical success of a, a queer love story. Now, keep in mind, this is written in the 70s, but this book is very good. It is a very good book, except for one little thing. The, the book is about a runner named Billy and the uh, his coach named Harlan and their relationship about, they're obviously both, it, it, Billy's in his 20s, Harlan's in his 30s. But what happens is Billy's training for the Olympics. He goes to the Olympics. At the end of the book, he's murdered. And that's the end of the book. So imagine a 15-year-old getting to see queer people in a book for the first time, and they die? They don't get to be happy? Um, I actually got to know Miss Nell Warren before she passed. She reached out to me after my very first book came out way back in 2011, and she said, I really like that. And I said, I love you. You ruined my childhood. I love you. And she re she responded, I really wish that hadn't been the first book you heard. And she is she's a she was a wonderful woman. She actually wrote two sequels to The Front Runner that were what I think what was her basic basically an apology to the queer community because she allowed the characters to grow and breathe and find strength. The other book, so sorry for this, where the red fern grows. Um <laughs> If you know me, you know I love dogs. You know I love my dog in particular. For some reason, I still read Where the Red Fern Grows every single year. I know what happens. I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen to those red coonhounds. And I still like, maybe it'll be different this time. 
and this and it never is and so by the time and another and one other book that will probably explain me i like many people of my age who came of age in the 70s 80s and 90s i was probably 11 years old when i started reading stephen king and he has still to this day is my favorite author i i adore everything he does and the fact that he's still alive and publishing two books a year in his 70s man we could, if only we could all be so prolific at that oh. because, because i'm 40 right now and i'm tired <laughs> I'm 37. Like two weeks, I, I'm tired. The nap I took before I came here was necessary. <laughs> yes. Question. Go ahead. We've got like no minutes, but we're going to give them to you. And maybe we have one more after that. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> no pressure. When I write, I sometimes go back and I'm like, what the fuck did I write this? Do you have like a, a line from any of your books that you're like, hey, shit, I came up with this. I wrote this myself. All right. The question is that like sometimes when you're writing, you have that line, you're like, what is it? I like that question. Remind me and I'll give you a cut arc uh, in the lives of puppets. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, there is. It's the, in this book specifically. There is a there is a quote in here that I think is the heart of the novel. That is everything this novel stands for. And that is comes from Nelson. And it's when Nelson is towards the end of the novel, when Nelson is talking about time. How Nelson says, we think we have so much of it, but when it really counts, we don't have very much at all. And I, if there's one thing that I wanted people to walk away from this book thinking about and learning is the question that was posed to Wallace. What will you do with the time you have left? Because we are finite. Even now, the seconds ticking away, we're, everybody in this room one day will close their eyes for the very last time. But between now and then, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with your time? Are you going to be a good person? Are you going to try to become a better person? Or are you just going to let the nihilism of the world that we seem to find ourselves in right now swallow you whole? I hope that you will try to be as good or better than you were the day before, because that's what I try to do. Do I always succeed? Uh, no. <laughs> For example, I was 10 minutes late today. So, <laughs> But I, I just, I think that the question, Nelson's words about time and then leading to what will you do with the time you have left is something that I think about a lot now, especially given the privilege of my position and where I'm at and the fact that um, books like Under the Whispering Door, House in the Cerulean Sea, The Extraordinaries are showing up on Chand and Band and Challenge lists. I'm like, okay, wait. I mean, you probably understand that yeah. text completely. It's the fact that, but it shows you the gamut. It shows you the kind of books that he writes or they write and the kind of books that I write. Hey. And, oh, thank yeah. you. And um, and the fact that there's there's a gulf between them that they are about the queer experience, but it does not matter to those people. They still want all of those books out because it's not about protecting the children. It's about homophobia. <laughs> These people are all raging homophobes and that's what this whole thing is about. All right, we have time for one more. Okay, the hand that just shot up wildly. Go ahead. I like your shirt. I'm trying to say authentic in, in trans colors. Uh question is about how do you sort of let your guard down and bear your soul on the page as an author? So I, I don't know the type of book you are writing. So I'm just going to focus on what it was like for me writing what, like books like Under the Whispering Door. So Under the Whispering Door was as brutally honest as I could be about what grief does to a person. And the reason I did that was because if I sugarcoated it, or if I had if I had tried to tamp down on certain things, like say Alan, the the murder victim in the book, or or Cameron and his suicidal ideation and what happened to him after, it would have been inauthentic because I'm not being true to myself. The thing I have to ask myself when I'm writing and when I am, as you say, bearing my soul and putting myself on the page like that, is if I'm doing it for a reason, if I'm being authentic when I do it, 
And what's the point of why I'm doing it? With this book, the reason I did it was because that sort of grief is something that everybody understands. But what I don't think that they always understand too is how grief can turn toxic, how it can turn grief is inherently selfish. That's the whole point of grieving. But if you let that become all you know, like I did, then you run the risk of losing everything that you are as a person. And so I am, you know, I'm 40 years old. I don't have time for bullshit anymore. So when I'm writing something, I want to be as real and as true as I possibly can, because what, again, it comes down to the idea of what, how much time do I have left? I don't know. I absolutely have no idea. So why don't I make the most of what I'm doing right now? And if there is something holding you back, if there is something that, that you're worried about that, that you're thinking, oh, I can't, I don't want to show this part of myself to other people. You don't need to say it's part of yourself. You can write it down and put it in the book. And the, somebody comes up to you and says, oh, what was well, this like? I have no idea. I don't know why that's, I just felt like writing that. You, you can be a liar. <laughs> you need to be in that regard. But here's the thing. Until you can be honest with yourself and, and truthful with yourself and like that, it's going to hold you back. It's still going to hold you back. So you need to, you know what? Here's what you want to be perf brutally honest where I've reached. I've decided I've gotten to the point in my life where I don't give a shit what other people think about me. And that is something that is scary, but it's also so freeing. It is so freeing not to have to worry about what every single person thinks of you. Because if I did, I'd go insane. Growing older, like does this to you. Like, I, I can't wait to get more embarrassing. Right, right. So like, right. Like my, my friends tell me, TJ, we know, we know that you're getting ready for your curmudgeon phase because <laughs> that's what you want. And that is exactly yeah. what I want. I want a curmudgeon phase where I go live off in the woods in a cabin and people try to come onto my property. I'm like, no, Go away. Get him, Hank. Get him, Hank. Get him, Hank. With his little googly eyes bouncing. <laughs> he still has googly eyes. Anytime he loses one, I put one on there. Hey, that was a really good question. Afterwards, you get the cop the other copy of In the Lives of Puppets. Thank you for that. I love that. Yeah, we are at eight o'clock. I'm supposed to be we're supposed to be all done here, right? Yeah. Thank you so incredibly much, especially to Lainey Rose over here, who's the best. Hey, thank you so much for doing this. And look at your, sh I didn't even get a chance to look at your shirt. That There's shirt is an awesome. incredible queer book group here, and they read by genre, which is very inclusive and cool. So freaking cool. Yeah. And thank you for the lovely host who, who, who put up with me being late and <laughs> was so awesome. Anyways, you're awesome. Well, thank you all for being here. Yes, our book club, Queering the Narrative, meets monthly. Every month we pick a genre, and then you read any book within that genre that has queer characters or a queer author. Yeah, yeah. it's cool, right? Um, so we really like it. Uh, feel free to sign up. We have a monthly newsletter that goes out, too, so keep your eyes out for that. So for the rest of the evening, we will now be transitioning to our signing line. Um, I'm going to bring out a table for our authors to sign. If you have not purchased a copy yet, that is how you get into the signing line. Our copies are upstairs. If you have brought outside books, we are only sending two outside books per person. And if you are willing and able to put your chairs over to the side so the staff member can collect them, we will start the signing line at the science section right there. And there are also free Vanessa Kelly art posters over by is the Vanessa desk. here. There she is. Oh, hi, here you are. Hello. Yes, Vanessa, you guys, Vanessa drew the art for Under the Whispering Door. And I'm, she is the, the, the most phenomenal, one of the most phenomenal artists I've ever had the pleasure of working with. So yeah. it's just so good. Yeah. So thank you all for being here tonight. Yeah.